John chapter 8 and verse 31 and verse 32 says the following then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him if you abide in my word you are truly my disciples you shall know the truth somebody say truth and the truth shall set you free last night we talked about freedom how we have to recognize we have to uh, we have to re uh, receive recognize and then resist and tonight we're going to talk about continue to talk about the same theme i want to stay faithful to the theme of this conference set free but i want you to notice in the verse 32 unlike in the verse 36 jesus said in the verse 32 you will know the truth and the truth will set you free in the verse 36 he says whom the son sets free is free indeed in the verse 32 it says the truth will set you free not the truth that is real but the truth that you know you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free Muhammad said he is the seeker of truth Buddha said Muhammad said he's the prophet of truth Buddha said he's the seeker of truth and Jesus said he is the truth so what it says in here is that if you will know the truth not the truth that will set you free but the truth that we know will set us free so there is freedom that Jesus gives us and there is freedom that knowing the truth brings into our life this right away puts something very simple in the beginning is that not all freedom comes in person's life through prayer very beautiful I see man some of you enjoying them as much as I do not all freedom comes through prayer some freedom comes through knowledge that's what Jesus said 36 says whom the son sets free is free 32 says if you know the truth you become free there are people and many of us can receive our freedom through knowing the truth some people when they know the truth they become free so if knowing the truth gives you free then knowing a lie makes you bound let me say that again if knowing the truth makes you free then knowing a lie makes you slave the truth liberates lies bind the truth sets us free but see it's not the truth that sets you free it's the truth you know that sets you free see you can have a bread on the shelf and that bread will not feed you unless that bread goes from the shelf into your hungry mouth you can have paint in the bucket but that paint will not change the color of the walls unless that paint leaves the bucket and goes on the wall the truth in the bible the truth in christ does not set you free if it stays in the bible and stays in christ that truth has to be known by us experienced by us and that truth sets us free and it's something that cannot happen when pastor prays for you it's something that only happens when you do your homework amen well pastors will love this message because we know what I'm going to share right now this is a trouble we'd have when it comes to freedom many people think if I could only have another person pray for me, I will be free. There is a freedom you can get from verse 36. But there is only freedom you're going to get from verse 32. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. We're going to stay on the same topic. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 43 when the unclean spirit goes out of a man he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none then he says i will return to my house somebody say my house somebody say my house he says i will come back to my house from which i came 
And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. And the Bible says he brings more evil and it becomes worse for the person that has ever been before. Now listen to this story very carefully. This story has been usually used to explain when a demon leaves a person and the person does not have a filled with Jesus, then the demon comes back and brings seven times more. But the logic behind that explanation is this. If the demon leaves a person, he can't really leave a person without Jesus' help. And a lot of people who get free and the demon leaves the person, then the demon has the audacity to still say that my house. See, if you're a Christian, you believe in Jesus, you're not the devil's property. You may be the devil's target, but you're not his property. You might be the part of the devil's attack, but you are not part of his property. What gives the right to a demon spirit to call my place? And this is something I'm going to share with you. Pay attention very carefully. Most of us think when an evil spirit or demons or Satan attacks a person's life, their chief goal is to destroy a person. And that is true according to John chapter 10 verse 10. But there also a goal that they have in attacking a person's life is not just to destroy the person but to build a mindset within a person that they can call their home. Why? Because the Bible says there's this thing called a strong man. It means it's an evil spirit that attacks a person's life. Where does the strong man live? In a stronghold. A stronghold is a mindset a stronghold is a house of thoughts. The assignment of every demon is not only to destroy you, but to build you. To build within you a mindset that even when they leave, they still have a place called home, your mind. A stronghold becomes the devil's home. And how does he build a stronghold? Through lies. Lie after a lie believed by you accepted by you and even when the evil forces is gone and the person is free from demonic influence but they're not free from the mindsets of lies that the devil has built in them see the demons live quickly mindsets are not broken quickly because they've been built over a long time and the enemy's goal is not just to destroy you it's also to build within you a mindset that even when he is removed through your prayer through the prayer of someone else and then you simply polish that negative defeated doubtful mindset clean it up with the religious behavior modification he still has a place he calls home the place he built so this is not just, oh, if a person is delivered, do they speak in tongues? No, 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 this is more. This is when a person is delivered, is their mind renewed? The mind of a person can be either a place for the Holy Spirit to work or the enemy to get a call back home. That's why Jesus said, not only you can be free when I touch you, but you also must be free when you know my word because there are certain damages the enemy does in a person's mind that only the truth can liberate not Jesus is touching it's Jesus is teaching that can set a person free can somebody say amen? amen and so tonight we are going to talk about a topic that will be titled how to make devil homeless <laughs> you can't destroy him some people say, I'm going to kill the devil. Too bad. He's not going to die. I'm going to send him to hell. You cannot do that. Only God can do that in the book of Revelation. But you know what you can do? You can make him homeless. That means you can destroy his home. And the only bad part is you can't do it in one day. You can't do it in one meeting. Pastor cannot do it for you. I cannot do it for you. Jesus cannot do it for you. You know what can do for you? Truth. You know what builds the house for the devil? It's a lie. Build up on a lie. Build up on a lie. Few lies like, I'm ugly. That's a lie. You believe in it? I'm worthless. Another lie. God never heals me. 
God never comes through for me. Another lie, another lie. And here you have a mansion for every demon in hell to have a resting place. And it's a matter of time. I'm not saying you will have demons, but you will live in constant torment because Satan has something in you he calls his home. Strong man lives in stronghold. A stronghold is a house of thoughts. Thoughts fixed with lies. This is not just one thought. These are thoughts that have become your mindset. It's the way you think. It's the way you see. It's the moment somebody doesn't accept you or doesn't call you or doesn't do something. You immediately, poof, you flush out. Again, somebody. Okay, they treated me just like the other person. Again, that thing comes out, out of you. It's automatic. You don't even think about it. It's an automatic response that comes from the inside. That is called a mindset. A biblical word for it in 2 Corinthians, a stronghold. And these strongholds cannot be destroyed in one day. They can be destroyed over time, but they cannot be destroyed without the truth. Not the truth alone, but the truth you apply. I was very fortunate to stay in the house of Vladimir Silchuk, who sits over there. And uh, he gave me, uh, they gave me soap uh, to take shower with. The presence of soap in the bathroom did not make me clean. I didn't say anything smart. Don't, don't, don't think too hard. It's very simple. Okay. Samuel, what do you say? Relax. Everything is fine. I didn't say anything smart. The presence of soap in the bathroom did not make me clean. You know what made me clean? Applying the soap I had in the bathroom. You have everything you need to be free within your reach. Stop coming and asking God to make you clean when He provided the soap that you don't use. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Turn to your neighbor and say, stop stinking. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you got to remove stinking thinking. You got to remove stinking thinking. The main three lies that people believe about their mind, you can just write down these, these three lies that people believe that cause the enemy to build a mindset in them. The first lie is this, what I think is not important. What I do is more important. Most people are so focused on their behavior that what happens inside of this little box between their two ears has no importance to them whatsoever. Most people are convinced is that, see, because the religion, the church, the tradition, we, the focus in the church many times, and I'm guilty of it as, as many, but anybody else. When somebody comes, you know, with tattoo, with earrings, with, you know, dressed up in a certain way, living in a certain way, our main goal first is to change their behavior. Especially when they get saved and they're still kind of wearing certain things or doing certain things like, hey, you got to stop doing this, stop doing this. And people are quicklier to re quick, quickly registers in their mind. If I am to be pleasing to God, I got to change the way I am on the outside. And so people quickly clean up their outside while their inside is literally pure junk. But because nobody can see it, because the pastor cannot see it, you cannot see it, I cannot see it. That inside is always left unattended because it doesn't bother nobody. The funny part is your thoughts cannot be seen. So is the Holy Spirit. You know what He sees? Your thoughts. The way people see your face is the way He sees your thoughts. Your behavior to Him is not as vital as your thoughts. Why? He is invisible. What He sees? Invisible things which are your thoughts. So to Holy Spirit, these are more important. That's why Jesus said, a man might not commit adultery with the woman, but if he thinks about it, in God's eyes, God says, I already see you doing it. In God's world, it's not what you do, it's what you think. Why? Because God is invisible and so are your thoughts. They are in a fourth dimension world. They are in a world that cannot be seen by men. And so that is why you have to break the first lie that how I live, has nothing to do with how I think and it's more important that I live clean than I think clean. Many of us are extremely traditional in our behavior and extremely horrible in our thinking life. Thinking life is completely what I think, well it's my own problem, it's my own business. What you think has a huge effect on your behavior and your relationship with God. It's been proven even scientifically. When they did an experiment once on five millionaires and they took millions, all those millions from those five million millionaires and they made him homeless 
They, this experiment, experiment, I think it was about five years that was lasting. I don't know, remember the details. But the main point was this. They made these millionaires homeless. And at the same time, they took five homeless people and gave all the millions of these five millionaires to the homeless. For five years, they wanted to do an experiment to see how will the millionaires behave being homeless and how will the homeless behave being millionaires. Within the first few years, all the five millionaires became millionaires and the rest of them, it took them five years to become millionaires. They went to the poor, the homeless, and they found out that within a few years, those who were homeless became homeless and some actually were admitted to mental institution because of a suicide attempt. And they made this conclusion, to be a millionaire has nothing to do with money, it has to do with the state of your mind. And they also made a conclusion, to be poor has nothing to do with money, it all has to do with the state of mind. If the world has done the study and has seen that, that a person's mind is so much more important than their circumstances and their behavior, we have to, as a church of Jesus Christ, come to that realization. God lives in invisible world and what you think and what's going on inside of here is far more important than kind of how hands you raise, how words you speak and how many times you even come to church. All these things are important, but the state of your mind is more important. Can somebody say amen? Many times when we get into problems in our life and we face difficulties, we face challenges. These challenges, they begin to come into our mind. And eventually our mind begins to think like that. I want you to write down second lie. The second lie usually says the following. The reason I think bad is because my life sucks. The reason why I am negative is because my circumstances are negative. The reason why I am the way I am is because the things around me are really bad. And if that God that you're talking about who wants me to have a positive mind, a mind full of faith, a mind full of love, and a mind full of good things, well tell Him to change my life. And when He changes my life, I will go ahead and change my mind. Sounds like the same thing the Pharisees told Jesus. If you get up from the cross, we'll change our mind about you. And when three days later he got out from the dead, did they change their mind? Oh no! They bribed the soldiers and they spread the lie that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It proves one thing, if God changes your circumstances, but you don't choose to take the truth inside to change the things in your mind, God cannot change your mind. To the degree you allow the truth to come inside is to that degree you allow God to come inside of your mind. You cannot simply choose negative thoughts, choose defeat, choose insecurity and plead with God change my mind. That is not how He changes your mind. He can only do it through your acceptance and your applying of the truth. We have to demolish this lie that the only reason why I think negative it's because my life is negative. I had the opportunity to go on a cruise ship with my wife on our honeymoon. A cruise ship was really big, with thousands of people there, many floors. We went through oceans. There was so much water in the ocean. There was enough water to drown us, the ship. And we went through it without drowning. Do you know how? Not by emptying the ocean of water. Many of you thinking the only way you can get through the ocean is if you get the water out of the ocean. That's when you tell God, if you change my life, I'll change my mind. It's like saying for a ship, the only way I can get through an ocean is if God will remove the water. Or maybe you can learn how not to allow the water to get inside. Well, that's not possible. Ships can do it. I'm sure you can do it too. Well, you're not better than a ship. That is a piece of wood. You're a piece of creation. Somebody say amen. amen. Say, I can do it. Say, through Christ, I can do all things. Say, through Christ, I can change in my mind. You cannot accept this lie that the reason why you feel bad is because you look bad. And please understand, I'm not making this up because I've read it from some kind of a self-help book. 
I'm sharing this with you because this was a transformative truth in my life. I was convinced, some of you share, shared a testimony last night, I was convinced if God will heal, you know, my, my physical eyes, then I will walk around with boldness. Not, I didn't know that, if, you know, if that would happen, I'm going to walk around with arrogance, not with boldness. I had two eye surgeries, one in Ukraine, one in the United States. All of that, not because so I can see better. I have all four, five, four siblings with us today and two parents. I'm the only one in our family who doesn't wear glasses. My eyes is so good that when I try to fake it so I can get glasses, I still couldn't qualify. I just, I have a very good eyesight. So I don't have a problem with the vision. My eyes don't hurt. Everything is fine. So don't come afterwards to pray for me. When I mention people, everybody lines up, you know, like, I just want to pray for you. Don't worry. Let me pray for you because you wear eye contacts. So, but I have a good vision. Everything is fine. But because of my appearance, I felt like if my appearance could be a little bit modified, I will walk around with this boldness on inside. The reason why I felt so bad is, well, I mean, I couldn't help it. Every time I look in the mirror, it just, just couldn't help to think like that. And I came to God and I said, God, you need to change it. And God says, do you want me to change your face or do you want me to change your mirror? You've been looking at the wrong mirror every morning. And God changed the mirror. You know, every time somebody used to meet me, the first question they would ask me, they wouldn't even ask me my name. They would ask me, did you have an accident or something? What happened to your eyes? And it was the same thing as putting a salt on the wound. It hurt me. It reminded me that people, the only thing they saw me is my ugliness. Now, nobody asks me literally I mean I, I look forward to somebody actually bringing it up either they're afraid or ashamed I don't know but and, and the, one of the reasons why is because even as I'm speaking to you I'll, I'll demonstrate it most of you are not aware of the fact one of my eyes is smaller than the other Do you know why you're not aware because I'm not either you would if I would be on the inside I'm not that person that you see right now on the inside I look at a different mirror and in that mirror says I'm a creation of God God loves me and what you see is just the skin stretched over a skeleton. Mine happened to be like this, yours happened to be like that. When we all die, there's going to be no skin, just a skeleton, so we're all going to be equal. Yeah. <laughs> Don't believe in that lie. That the reason why you think the way you think, you feel the way you feel, is because the way your life is. No. You think the way you think, you feel the way you feel, because you're looking at the wrong mirror. It's because you're believing a lie instead of a truth. You're believing. It's just the wrong thing. You will say, no, 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 that's not possible. And if still you change your diet, God cannot change your life. Can somebody say amen? The third lie, and this is the lie, it says, I cannot control my mind. The moment somebody hears how important it is to change the way you think and to allow the Word of God to come inside, the, the first response I hear always from people is this one. Well, I tried. I can't change my mind it's actually a lie that is somewhat true this is why it's true you actually cannot change your mind because a mind is a mindset okay and the reason why you got the mindset is because you've been not been monitoring your thoughts for the past 22 years diligently so you let anything that came to you build whatever you want to build and you come to this big mess that it took 23 years to build and you wanted to destroy it in one blow of course it's not gonna happen it's not gonna work you can't change your mind without monitoring your thoughts A mindset cannot be changed in one day but to monitor your thoughts it could start today when you begin to focus on that you will realize first thing you will come you have a first revelation this is gonna be the first revelation that 99% of your thoughts are negative and they stick to you like super glue and all the positive thoughts don't like you and they only stay as much as a snowflake on the warm hand and they <laughs> And you come to the conclusion, I'm a negative, pessimistic, complaining, whining victim. Welcome to the club. We all are like that by Adam nature. And through Christ, step by step, we begin to see change in our life. Can someone say amen? amen. What would happen if the United States of America would treat the border patrol 
the way you treat your thoughts. What would happen if it's just in Russia, you decided to come to the United States, you got your luggage and you made some little paper says, I am an American citizen and you misspell the American. And you come to the United States, you brought your papers and the USA, you know, officer looks at you and you're like, sir, want to go to America? Okay, welcome, welcome. And you're a terrorist, a Russian terrorist. You come into America, what would happen to our country? You know what would happen to our country? There would be no country. Do you know why this country is today alive? It's because guys who don't have proper documentations cannot pass through the security. Have you ever asked your thought if it has a proper documentation? You're ugly. God doesn't love you. Nothing good ever happens to you. Everything you take fails. Every gift they give you, you break. You constantly have accidents. Every relationship you start fails. Everybody who loves you always abuses you. Those thoughts are illegal. The United States won't pass illegals through the country. You do all the time in your own mind. No wonder why your mind is a mess and your life is a result of that too. You're pretty, you're educated, you're awesome, you're cool, you're very, you're very, everything is good. Except you don't have a border control in your life and anything and anything that Satan wants to send, you are there without checking papers, without checking passport, without checking IDs and it comes in, it stays there, builds a fortress and then you come to God, oh God, please destroy it. Set up some security. Not every thought has the right, has the right to pass through. It can come into you and you say, can I see your papers? A thought can come in, God doesn't love you, just, this place is not for you. You say, can I see your papers? Where, where does it say in the Bible? And then you tell what Jesus says, get behind me Satan. You have to do that. Many times I would do that, even sometimes during churches, some weird, just stupid thought would come into my head. And under my breath, I don't do it very loud. And probably this is not very right, pastors will correct me. And this is not theological, but under my breath I say, Satan go to hell. That's exactly what I say because it helps me to say you're not you don't belong here this is this mind is too precious if the country America can protect this territory I am a lot more important to God than the country because I God died for me and I am going to protect and if thoughts come in they will always come but I will say listen you are not welcome here pack your bags and leave and they will say well here's I got some papers I said those fake papers they're not real these are the real papers get away with those fake papers God this is who I am and I'm gonna stand in there. Can somebody say amen? So I want to challenge you right now that these are the lies that the enemy uses to build a stronghold, to build himself a house and God wants to demolish this house. In the conclusion of this message, I am gonna just share with you two truths. I'll share with you three lies and I'm gonna share with you two truths, okay? Very simple, just two truths. I want you to write down two truths that will help you. I'm not saying it will change everything but it will help to get it started. The first th truth, if you are writing it down, write down is this, that you have to be convinced that God loves you more than you know. In Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19 says the following, Know the love of Christ, that means you have to know the love of Christ, which passes understanding. You know what the Apostle Paul is saying? He says, I want you to know that Christ loves you more than you know. This is the first step of a truth that begins to set your life free. When it comes to relationships, when it comes to finances, when it comes to any area of your life, it has to start with this, that God loves me. Not only when I am good, not only when my day is good, not only when the person behind me in Starbucks pays for my coffee or the person in front of me. Not only when the people that I like like me back. Not only when everything is fine in my family. God loves me. At my worst, at my best, He loves me. This is the truth that builds a mind that allows the Holy Spirit to do wonders in your life. The lie is, is what you feel. The truth is what God says. Jesus says in John chapter 3 verse 16 the following. He said, for God so loved the world.
for God so loved if it's a word the third part there that says so I remember taking because people always ask me how did you overcome all of your insecurities it was that verse and it was that third phrase so so not only God cared, not only God was sympathetic, not only God was willing to overlook, not only God was willing to pardon, not only God was willing to forgive, but He loved. That means affection, that means feelings were involved, that means He felt it. And the part that got me and it like a hook, like a fish that got on a hook, that's how I got on this verse, is that little hook that says, for God so loved, so not just loved, so loved and who he loved saints pope priests pastor the holy people the world the mess the messed up people you and me go right in into that part world and the amazing part is that a lot of people told you that they love you but many people have done very little to prove anything but God says I know you will doubt that I love you I know that you will question that I love you so I am going to back it up with the undis undisputable evidence I will give everything I got to prove to you once for all if you ever feel like I don't love you I'll give you a proof it's gonna be the cross and this is where the truth begins. The truth does not start with you are awesome. The truth does not start with you are handsome. The truth does not start with you are successful. The truth does not even start with you are righteous. This truth starts is with this God who is infinitely powerful, who is so holy and so righteous, He chose to love you. Not because you're lovable, not because you're worthy of it, but because He is love. When you allow that truth to come inside as a leader, as a young person or as a person who maybe just walked in into the church or maybe a person who's fed up with church and religion, I'm going to tell you what this truth will do. It will do exactly the same thing that a warm temperature in the room will do to an ice cube. It will slowly begin to melt ice. Nothing melts lies like an overwhelming sensation. There is a God and He deeply loves me. Especially when I am that world part. Because I know that He loves me. When I gave money to somebody, when I did something good, when I witnessed to somebody and I feel so good. But it's when I am the world part, when I act like the world, live like the world. That's where most of us are convinced He doesn't love me. And that's where God says He loves so the world you. The mess you, the lying hypocrite you, the betrayer backstabber you, the cheater you, the thief you, the you that you don't like you, the one that you hate you, that you he loves so much. Oh I know you know that God loves the you that you want to be. I know that God loves the you you plan to be at the end of next year the you that you pray to be one day but the you that's in the mess does that God love if you don't know that he loves the you that's the world you have a lie and it will defeat you the Bible says while we were yet sinners Christ died for us when did he die not when we realize we're in a mess and we need change. He died when we were still doing our sin. And then Christ died. This one has to come deep inside of your heart. That He loves me not when I get better. He loves me so I can get better. Without His love you won't get better. He loves the world. If you ever feel like you qualify, you're a candidate. He loves you. Before Jesus said that verse, He said something else. In the verse 15, 14, 
he talked about to Nicodemus he says that as the Moses lifted a serpent bronze serpent in the wilderness and he says so God will lift his own son that whoever looks to Jesus that he will be saved as in the day of Moses people look to the serpent and they got saved and when you read that something strikes you at the heart because you realize this is the first time Jesus compares himself to a snake he compared himself to a lamb a lion a snake a snake is bad a snake is symbolic of Satan but Jesus is saying that as this bronze serpent means it wasn't a real snake it was a made snake out of a bronze it looked red was lifted so whoever had bitten by a snake will look to it and they would be healed Jesus is saying what's going to happen on the cross God will make me according to Corinthians a sin I'm not just gonna be paying for your sin I will be your sin without ever doing anything sinful when did Jesus became sin did he hit somebody no did he do anything sinful no he became sin when God the Father placed the sin right on him he became a serpent why so that anytime you doubt how can I be righteous without doing right things that you will look to Jesus and ask the question how did he become sin without doing sin to receiving it and if he died never doing one sin but because God placed it on him and God turned his back knowing he never did anything right wrong it's just not his sin God you, you have to understand that his heart is clean his life is clean it's just this one event you can't turn your back on him see God's head knew I have to turn my back on him so that when you didn't do anything right but you have his righteousness he can turn his face toward you and anytime you doubt and you say there is no way God can be so good look at how angry he was when Jesus didn't do anything wrong but had sin on him This is the foundation of destruction of a wrong mindset. God loves me. I know some of you have a little panic inside. Are you giving people excuse to sin? No, 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 trust me. I've seen people get filled with the revelation of God's love. The last thing is on your mind is to sin. But when you tell people what to do and what not to do, they want to they don't have the power because his love is the power the first truth deliberates you you have to embrace it deep inside of your heart is the way I am not the way I know you pastor know you people know you people on Facebook know you people on Instagram know you but the way you know you the mess you are in the struggles that you are in the inconsistency that you got that one step forward three steps backwards that world you God loves it's an explainable love it's unreasonable love it's mad love there's no reason for this love if you don't receive this you can not change this melts your eyes and it helps you to rise up and do what God wants you to do can somebody say amen yeah. the number two truth we said, I don't said two truths second truth so the first truth is that no God loves you more than you know so that means the very moment you find out that God loves you he know he loves you a little bit more now he always loved you more but it's just that moment even right now as I'm speaking I know some of you the love of God is increasing more but remember the truth you have to know that he loves you a little bit more It will be freeing. Some of you, you'll be free from condemnation, free from sin, and free from shame. The truth number two. Don't think on the level of your circumstances. Think on the level of the Word of God. Don't think on the level of the circumstances. Think on the level of the Word of God. 
Romans chapter 12 verse 2 is the famous verse which talks about conforming, renewing our mind so that our life can be changed. And this says the following, do not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. I want you to understand the first part of it which says do not be conformed. That means a person's mind cannot be changed until they have to give themselves permission not to let their mind come down to the level of their feelings or to the level of their circumstances. Do not be conformed to the world. It means don't let your mind come down to the level of your feelings. Your feelings can be here, your mind should be here. You have to give yourself permission to do that. Not only to know God's love, but also to not think on the level of your circumstances of your, or your feelings. But to think on the level of the promise of God. When Jesus was facing the death of Lazarus, and the Bible says that everybody came and they were weeping and crying, and Jesus stood there and there was the smallest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. His feelings dropped on the level of death he wept in an instant he said show me the tomb how can someone who just is grieving can go and raise the man from the dead because while he was weeping on his level of the mind he was right here his emotions dropped to death his mind stayed on resurrection and many people feel like when you're facing a tomb and your emotions are skyrocketing back and forth and you let your mind drag your drag it also to the bottom be like Jesus feel the bottom think on the top feel death think resurrection feel despair think light of God feel that insecurity you will feel it inside of you it will be so real tears will be rolling down the eyes but when the tears are finished rolling you have to say show me the tomb because he who lives inside of me is greater than he who comes against me you say is it possible if jesus did it you and also can do it it's okay to feel on the level of your circumstances. It's okay to feel on the level of your past. But do not let your mind give it, don't give it permission to go with your, with your feelings. Let your feelings go where they go. But you tell your mind you're not following feelings. You're following what God said. Because the feelings are like weather. They always change. They always betray and lie to me. One day they feel this, another day they feel that. So mine, you stick with me. Let feelings go where they go. My mind, you stick with the Word of God, which never changes. It created the world, it holds the world, and it will hold my life. Give your mind permission not to follow its feelings. Give your mind permission. Get, let your feelings feel what they feel. Your mind is still here. Sometimes you will come to service and you had hell at home. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. Just literally, you just shattered. And at that point, you can never, you may, you may think, well, I can't, I can't. Yes, you can. It's a permission you authorize. You can at that moment, the Bible says, let the weak say, I'm strong. What if every evidence of weakness is in your body? And what if every evidence for strength is also at your disposal? Let your emotions feel the weakness. Let your mind embrace his strength. I remember listening to a testimony of one lady, young woman, at the age of two. She was on a horse and somebody was taking a picture of her. The flash from the camera spooked the horse. The horse jumped really quickly and a little two-year-old girl on the horse jumped from the horse head down and had a severe brain injury because of that she developed seizures anytime she would have this epileptic attacks attacks it would render her body she would hurt herself and all these things were happening she would go to school seizures and these epileptic attacks they will continue to happen in school until her parents took her out of school out of the embarrassment because everybody made fun of her just to protect her self-esteem and they kept her in the house at the age of 13 or 14 um, she was qualified to have a special brain surgery during the brain surgery she had a stroke which made half of her body completely useless 
after some time she recovered from stroke because the brain dam brain uh, surgery wasn't successful the seizures increased by four times and she was rendered useless for the rest of her life the only thing she would do with her mom is she would sit in front of a tv and they will watch this christian television where pastor would pray uh, or one of the ministers one of the talk shows would pray for the sick one particular time a lady who was also with that man sitting in the chair and she says there is a girl you're a young woman you're watching me and I see a damage due to a horse injury done to your brain and God is healing that and this girl when she heard that it was like an ounce of air for somebody who's dying of suffocation and she grabbed it she says mom this is from me i believe and i'm healed next 30 days she didn't have seizures it was the most glorious day she's ever had she was walking around rejoicing and she was convinced she was healed until on the 30th day while doing some things in the kitchen out of control out of nowhere the seizures came back except this time as though all 30 days of seizures were combined into 30 minutes she was like a broken piece of metal shivering on the floor except this time not being able to control her body every voice in her head said see you're not healed see God didn't heal you and she says in that moment when literally hell not only her body was out of control but her mind seems to be flooded with the thoughts you're not really healed she says I in my own mind took the word of Isaiah 53 and against my feelings and against the evidence of my body shivering on the floor I started to scream in my mind by his stripes I am healed he's like I knew I looked like an idiot because in my mind there is nothing to hold on to except this word I'm shaking under seizures when the seizures were over everything was done she testified since that day it was seven years not one seizure you will say it works don't give your mind permission to go to the level of your feelings I'm not saying to change your feelings you can't control your feelings at times at times you can't control your circumstances at times you can't control how your body reacts you always can control what you think if you align it with the Word of God some of you here today you are in that situation right now where you thought you were but the evidence is speaking against you that you're not you're broken, shattered. I'm giving you a life jacket. Please, tell your mind, it's okay to trust God when everything around you